the time has gone when you could just be narrow focus and say, I'll do marketing. Okay. I mean, I hope that there's, and, and I don't want to use the word, cliched word, general management, but you need to have multiple skills. When I, when I graduated as an industrial engineer, I would never, ever have thought that I could sell anything to save my life. Today, I see myself as salesperson number one for Zensa. Because, I mean, unless I articulate the vision even to customers, you're not going to sell anything. So, I mean, it's just a question of discovering that there is no potential problem in any one of us. And with the kind of education you have, you could succeed in anything. Way. So we only ask people that, look, keep your mind open. <coughs> I mean, you could be consulting, domain, technical, HR. There are so many young, young MBAs who start off in consulting, move into HR. And in fact, I have a very bright girl who did exactly that and is now the sales manager for our entire West Coast operations in the US. And completely no background in sales, but just the willingness to say can do and make it happen. So we just look at what we call 5Fs and we actually calibrate every one of 7,000 people against this. How fast can you think? How focused can you be to deliver a result, not long term, but in the next one year that you've taken up? How flexible are you? Now, if you think about it, focus and flexible have a slight paradox between them. But flexibility is important in terms of planning your career. And I have people in Zensar in the last 10 years who have done five completely different roles, have been a miserable failure in maybe one of those five, but we know that they have the potential to be trained to be successful. So everybody is perpetually trying to do new things. And of course, the last two, which is not just the rain dance parties, but how can you build a friendly and fun culture in the organization? And my theme always is, any Monday morning you get up and I tell my guys, and you say, oh, shoot, I've got to go to Zensar. I say, please quit. See, because if you're unhappy in your job, and you also have five, five people working with you, your gloomy, down in the dumps face will demotivate everybody else. So unless you feel like smiling, unless you feel that you know, you're out to change the world, you'll, you'll actually destroy the organization. So this is something we measure all the time, that how much fun are people having, not just in parties, but at work as well. So that's the point. And my point is, and this is the last part of my session. Oh, sorry, I'm overshooting by three minutes. But you will need to have leadership skills at a very early age. So if anybody told you that, look, organization hierarchy is all about management trainee to executive to manager to leader, perish the thought. The most successful amongst you, and, and think about this 10 years from now, are people who will be leading teams or leading technologies or leading functions at a very early age. And there's nothing that stops you from saying by the age of 30, I can't be a significant leader in whichever. Could be in the social sector, could be in your own company, could be in government, could be in corporate sector. What, is it, what does leadership mean? And I'll just give you my view of leadership and close with that. And as I said, I'm not for a minute saying that this is the only view. What do leaders do? This is obvious. And I am a great belief in the leading from the front kind of leader. I mean, there is a school of thought which says a leader should sit in an ivory tower and make strategy and leave it to the rest. But in industries like ours, you know, which is growing all the time, you need to have a do fanatism in, in leadership. You must also have the ability, which is there in the last line, you must be able to redo. The ability to quickly say I made a mistake and go back and correct that mistake is as important and it's a humility characteristic. But if you don't have that humility and you kind of keep focusing on something which is obviously wrong, I think somewhere you're going to flop. So that's important. So a few lessons. There's always this feeling of leaders creating followers. My belief is that organizations can have thousands of leaders, which is why I'm saying none of you are too young to be a leader. If each one takes full responsibility for their actions, you get a better organization than by having 10 leaders and 1,000 followers. Because those kind of organizations can never grow faster than what it takes to be industry leaders. Leadership too, I said, I don't, I mean, I probably know the least about sales, about technology, about HR in the organization. So if you have the right, I mean, it's like Zubin Mehta. Okay. If you have the best violin player, the best cellist, the best piano player, but you're able to extract the best out of each of them, that is what the symphony and the orchestra is all about. And to my mind, that's what leadership is all about. The third one is obvious. I mean, leaders are complete talent fanatics. I was telling the story to the, in the faculty meeting that I was in a cultural event in Niti three months back, and there was this really bright girl called Shubham Garg who was the compere of that cultural event. At the end of it, I went and told her, Shubham, I think you were just fantastic. I've never heard such great communication skills. So will you join Zensar when you finish your MBA or whatever? So she didn't believe me. She said, what? This is just one nice you know, CEO trying to be nice to management training kind of stuff. So I went back and found her on Facebook. And on Facebook, I made her a job offer, saying that, look, Shubham Garg, if you want to join Zensa, just let me know when. 
So the all buzz on Facebook saying, my God, must be the first time a CEO has made an offer on campus. The placement office got very worried. So I got a call from this guy, Ashok Pundir, who's a placement head, saying, Ganesh, you can't do all these things. Okay, you have to come through our process. I said, so what is your process? So you have to come and do a pre-placement talk, and then you have to do interviews. And I said, okay, we'll do all that. So I told my HR, guys, go through the formalities, but I want Shubham Garg. <laughs> okay. So finally, last week, we made her an offer. She may not join. That's a different story. But if I find somebody whom I believe has capability, it doesn't matter what the person's background is. Because that's a attitude spark that comes out of your eyes. The young lady who met me at lunch today, if you want a, if you want a job in Zensar, you know who to call. Okay, seriously. Okay, because those are the kind of people with the can-do attitude which are completely capable of changing the world. And I'm sure 50% of you or everybody in this room, to take Dr. Natarajan's point, is the can-do types and the guys who decided to stay back and study for tomorrow's exam, they don't cut it. Okay, so that's the difference. This is something which is obvious. I mean, Relationships is all about leadership. Leaderships, I mean, leaders cannot sit in their corner and say, I'm this boss and run. The reason I do so many of these academic uh, conversations, that's how you build you know, everything for your organization, whether it is in associations, academic context, etc. Leaders are great learners, master their organization, are great storytellers. In fact, my definition of the word CEO is very simple. It's what we call clairvoyant. What's a clairvoyant? Somebody who can look into the future. Nobody, as I said, can have a view of the next 10 years. But at least over the next two years, if you can look at what are the roadblocks, what are the possibilities, then you're creating an infinite set of possibilities for other leaders to work on. Evangelist, which is change. Orators, which is a, a, a force fit word for O, it's really communicators. Unless you communicate, communicate, communicate all the time, you can't be a leader. And there's one quarrel I have with the Indian MBA vis-a-vis -vis the Harvard Business School MBA. I mean, in a classroom, if I don't know how to stop the guys, I will not be able to talk. I mean, when you ask a question in Harvard, I mean, 40 hands will go up at the same time. I mean, it's also because their they're, they're marks dependent on the questions they ask, but nevertheless, okay. But it's amazing. I mean, it's like high energy flowing at you whenever you're teaching a class. So I think that's something that all of us are very shy as Indians. We need to learn to be more communicative. And that's one absolute aspect of leadership. So last point and last slide. How do you become a great leader? This is extremely important. Don't ever follow a role model who has different cat attributes than you have. So if you don't know yourself by now, ask your best friend, ask a coach, tell me, tell me what I'm good for. What kind of job should I take up? Don't go take, take up the first job with McKinsey that gives you a fat salary because you may not be, have the aptitude to be in McKinsey. And if you have a bad, I'm sorry, McKinsey is full of my friends, so I shouldn't say McKinsey, but in consulting, let me put it that way. Because if you have a bad experience there, it'll destroy your self-confidence. So choose a first job where you feel comfortable. You can always change after a couple of years. Nobody's stopping you. But just make sure that you're successful because it'll build your own self-confidence as an organization. So which is why I always tell people, don't choose the largest organization, the best pay. I know it's a waste of time telling you guys this, but nevertheless. So. But I mean, I have to make my pitch for choose the right thing that works for you. And of course, as I said, have a coach, which I just mentioned earlier. Most desirable, I think, irrespective of what you do, irrespective of what job you take up, what you want to do in your life, do not sit and wait for the world to change. It's not going to happen. Okay, if you have to make change happen, you will have to roll up your sleeves, you'll have to jump in, as they say in Japan, get into the gemba, which is the workplace, and show that things are better. And you'll make your mistakes. Nobody minds a doer who makes mistakes. What everybody minds, and I see too many MBAs who have that attitude, who sit back and say, in my strategy class, this is what I was told. I think we should do it this way. Do it and show me. Okay, you see my point? Because otherwise, you know, you can be, you can really, you know, cynically analyze everything to death, but people respect what, and of course, the, the, the fourth point is what I personally set as an agenda for myself. Every December, I sit down and look back at the year and say, have I made a fundamental difference to the thinking of at least five people? It doesn't matter who they are. They could be a vice president, they could be an academic institution, they could be a government employee. But have, we, have I really worked with that person to make a change? Because I believe that is going to be my lasting legacy and not how much profit Zensar made or Aptek made. It doesn't make a difference. And finally, okay, the very last lesson that every leader must learn to be remembered as a true leader through the generations is know when to leave. Thank you very much, guys. Okay. If anybody, if, anybody dare, if anybody dares to stay back and ask questions, I am free. So you, you guys have an exam.
So feel free if you have, if you, by the way, if you disagree with anything I said, feel free to say so. The best learning I get is when people argue and say, this is completely trash, and how can you make this statement? So feel free. But as a polite audience, you won't say. Any questions? Anything at all that comes to your mind? Yeah. Uh, you said about uh, finding and developing talent earlier. Has it ever happened in Zensa that a senior leader is suddenly quit without, you know, probably he's got a CEO office somewhere else and you have to rush through to replace him? That's a good point, and we have a, fortunately we have a very good leadership pipeline. So for instance, and don't quote me into any of my leadership, I mean, any of my eight direct reports, if they leave today, we already know who will replace them. In fact, we have a formal process in the entire RPG group, which is called OMR, which is Organization Management and Review. And every six months, we analyze the pipeline and say who can replace this guy if he walks under a bus, and who can replace this person over six months, one year, etc. So it normally doesn't matter to us. And fortunately, people don't quit, so that combination works very well. But it's a good question, and I think most people, most leaders don't worry enough about succession. Okay, I keep thinking that I should get myself replaced sooner or later, but I enjoy my job so much that I keep telling guys, guys, who will be CEO? Not tomorrow, but five years from now. So, hoping that nobody is in a hurry to take my job. Any other questions? Anything else that comes to your mind? Yep. So when you are joining new to the organization, you see a lot of responsibilities coming up. So you have ch chances of learning through your day-to-day uh, -day activities when you are new, newly joined in the organization. But once you go into that middle level management, you are most of the time, I mean, engrossed in your daily work. So do you in your organization do anything different so that these middle level managers are thinking more innovatively towards contributing to the organization. That's very good point. In fact, all our, everybody, our managers have, are measured on what we call innovate care, which is innovate, win, execute, team. Now, depending on your role, for, we don't want uh, accountants to get innovative. So for them, innovative will be you know, very little. And similarly, you don't want sales guys to worry about execution, because then they will only do execution. So it will change, so depending on the category. But everybody will have some component of innovate, win, execute, team. Because we believe that's what makes sense. And to the first point you made, you know, and this is again a, a last piece of advice I want to give you, try to, try to take on a role early in your career which is larger than what you think you can handle. Okay, and I, I still remember when I joined Crompton, out of the multiple management trainees that we had, most people chose large cities. Okay, they wanted Bombay, Delhi, Calcutta, Madras, whatever. Three of us chose Nasik, primarily because Nasik was a new plant of Crompton Greaves. And most of the existing middle managers were refusing to move to Nasik. And they used to have this syndrome called Teen Ka Panch. What does Teen Ka Panch mean? Because people in grade three were offered a double promotion to grade five just to shift to Nasik. And here we were management trainees with no house to stay in Bombay, but we didn't tell them that. We said, we will go to Nasik. And I still remember when I told my boss that, look, I want to be permanently placed in Nasik. So he, he said, what do you want to handle? I said, look, my capability is obviously systems and planning. So planning and systems. He said, can you also handle materials? I said, sure. Can you also handle one part of the shop floor? I said, sure. Within six months, I was handling a larger role than people 10 levels above me in Bombay. And I still remember, and this is my last story, and we had this, interestingly, both the, both the people who met me for lunch were from Kerala, so let me give you a Kerala joke. And another guy with me who came from XLRI, who was actually younger than me, he, was said, he also said the same thing, I'll move to H. So they said, will you handle the whole of HR for Crompton Reeves Nasik? This guy, you know, he's never handled HR. He's just done XLRI industrial relations. And this was in the days of a union leader whom some of you may have heard of called Datta Samant. So this was a Datta Samant union. Very virulent, very militant, 800 workmen. Here is Mr. Ravi Shankar going as HR head. And he doesn't, not only doesn't he know, does he know enough HR, he doesn't know Hindi or Marathi. <laughs> okay. So I still remember, and I'm going to stop here. Okay. And I still remember we were sitting one day and having chai in, in Nasik. When his assistant, a guy called Dharia, comes running to him and says, Boss, boss, canteen mein undir mama a gaya. Anybody know what undir mama is? Rat, right? So somebody from Maharashtra. No, Ravi Shankar has no clue what undir mama is. Okay? So Ravi Shankar knows the word mama, which is fairly common. So he thinks some worker's uncle has come. So he tells Dharia, Are, kya problem hai? Jaake usko bethao, khana wana khilao. <laughs> so then poor Dharia is at his wit's end saying, How do you tell this stupid MBA what undir mama is? He says, boss, wo ganpati jiske upar betha na, wo aata. <laughs> even, even then Ravi didn't get it. <laughs> so I'm saying, and the reason I'm saying this is, and today Ravi is, I mean, one of the top shots in HR and KPMG. Okay, I'm saying, we've all built our careers by grabbing responsibility as soon as possible. 
and not being afraid to say that, look, okay, if I fail, so what? Yeah, I mean, your, your background will give, give you another job. Don't worry about it. But don't take the road which is very safe, where somebody, and I, I, whenever I interview an MBA, an MBA says, you know, what is the training that I will go through in the first one year? My mentally, I'm saying, to gaya. <laughs> Come on, guys, you've been learning for the last 24 years. About time for you to perform, right? And learning is a continuous activity. I mean, I told you, you know, I, after I became CEO of Aptech, I went to IIT Bombay and said, I want to do my PhD. And they actually created a method by which you know, external candidates could do PhD in IIT Bombay. So both me and my wife did that. And after I was CEO in, in Zensar for five years, I told my boss I want to do the AMP in Harvard Business School. That's learning will automatically happen, but you've got to keep delivering. Okay, that's the main thing. Okay, now I know you guys are getting fed up, so thank you very much. Finally, and if any of you has a question, my email is there. Just feel free to shoot me an email or catch me after this. I'm here. I'm not going anywhere till tomorrow morning. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That was a wonderful talk indeed. Uh, I would like to request our director, Dr. R.C. Natarajan, on behalf of TAPME family, to present a small memento as a token of our gratitude. And you're not related to the Once again, sir, on behalf of the TAPME family, I'd like to thank Dr. Ganesh Natarajan for his words of wisdom and taking time despite his busy schedule. I'd like to thank our director, all the faculty members, the staff who's been who have been responsible for organizing this event. And lastly, I thank all of you who have been such patient listeners for making this event a grand success. Thank you. Good evening.